Welcome to Mexico Unexplained, where we will explore the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. This series presents information based partly on theory and conjecture. The podcaster's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bito. Welcome, and muy bienvenidos to episode number 332 of Mexico Unexplained where we examine the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. I'm your host, Robert Bitto. In step with his administration's attempt to bolster human rights awareness, the governor of the Mexican state of Coahuila, Ruben Moreira Valdez, signed a very special decree in May of 2017. The decree proclaimed the tribe of Black Muscogos to be an official indigenous people of the state of Coahuila, along with the Mexican Kickapoo, discussed in Mexico Unexplained episode number 285. After being a part of Mexican society for over 150 years, the Moscogos finally received a degree of official recognition from the government in Mexico. Long marginalized and their communities neglected, Governor Valdez's decree started the Moscogo on a path of cultural revitalization and rejuvenation that continues. The story of this unique people is now part of the state of Coahuila's official history books. The history of the Moscogo begins some 1,300 miles away from their current homeland in the swamps and woods of north-central Florida. Spanish Florida had been a haven for escaped slaves from the north from as far back as the late 1600s. Those fleeing the sugar and cotton plantations of the Carolinas and Georgia found a new life in the wilderness of this backwater of the Spanish Empire. Sometimes the slaves would strike out on their own or join groups of other escapees living in the wilds of this mostly undeveloped colony of Spain. More frequently, though, escaped slaves would approach native villages asking for help in what was to them a strange new land. The natives, collectively known as Seminole to outsiders, would often accept these runaways under certain conditions. For many years, mainstream history books would assert that these escapees became slaves of the Seminole in exchange for shelter and safety. A modern-day re-examination of this relationship likens it more to the feudal system of medieval Europe than to the slavery of the plantations in the English colonies and later the fledgling United States. Former black slaves would be given land and assistance by the Seminole, including protection if necessary, in exchange for a form of tribute, which may have included labor, but more often took the form of a portion of the harvest or a predetermined amount of handcrafted goods. It was more a live-and-let-live coexistence bordering on alliance between the escaped slaves and their indigenous protectors. After a few generations, there was much intermarriage between the groups. Also, many former slaves and their descendants adopted elements of seminal culture and language. By the time the Spanish sold Florida to the Americans in the early 1820s, the new overlords of the Florida Peninsula began to refer to the descendants of former slaves who lived among the natives as the Black Seminole. This name still is in use some 200 years later. The Americans had long coveted Florida not only for territorial expansion, but to take care of what they called the Indian raiding problem. Native bands from the southeastern U.S., would cause problems for American farmers and settlers and then cross the border into Spanish territory so as not to face reprisals. Also, native groups based in Florida would cross the undefined border to wreak havoc and then retreat into the woods and swamps of their homeland. Future U.S. President Andrew Jackson, who had long campaigned against native tribes in the southeast, became the first territorial governor of Florida, 
One of his first directives as governor was to order an attack on Angola, a settlement of black Seminoles located south of Tampa Bay on the Manatee River. The Americans captured some 250 people who were taken north and sold into slavery. This attack and others led to a general uprising of natives and blacks in Florida that ended up being called the Second Seminole War by historians. Besides the raids by the U.S. military into indigenous territory, the massive resistance ultimately had roots in the Americans' proposed removal policy. Under this policy, Florida's entire population of about 4,000 Seminoles and their 800 black Seminole allies were slated to be relocated to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, some 1,000 miles away. During the Second Seminole War, any black Seminoles who were captured were immediately sold into slavery. As the war was winding down and the Americans were winning, Black Seminole leaders made a deal with the U.S. to move to Oklahoma and remain free. This was in the year 1838. One of the leaders was known as John Horse, or Juan Caballo, who would later be known as the first chief of the Moscogo people in Mexico. In Oklahoma, the Seminole and the Black Seminole were relocated on lands under the administration of the Creek Nation. The Creek people had black slaves as agricultural workers on their lands and many times tried to enslave black Seminoles. In addition, black Seminoles were often targets of white American slave raiders who would capture them and forcibly take them to the plantations. Because of the continued conflict with the Creeks and the threat of kidnapping by slavers, black Seminole leader Juan Caballo and a Seminole sub-chief named Coacuchi, or Wildcat, came up with a plan to leave Oklahoma. The two set their sights on lands across the Rio Grande. For Juan Caballo's people, they didn't have to worry about slave raiders, or so they thought, because slavery had been abolished in Mexico many years before. In Mexico, Coacuchi's Seminoles would get out from under the domination of the Creek Nation and be away from the increasingly meddlesome U.S. government. It should be noted here that the two came up with this solution only after Juan Caballo made two trips to Washington, D.C. to advocate for his people. He had two simple pleas, more autonomy and security. His requests fell on deaf ears. Going off the reservation, so to speak, was not an option for the Seminoles or the Black Seminoles, as their treaties with the U.S. government confined them to their allotted lands in Oklahoma. So Juan Caballo and Coacuchi gathered a few hundred people and left under the cover of darkness in October of 1849. It took them months to traverse Texas, evading the U.S. Army and the Texas Rangers, who had orders to capture them and return them to Indian Territory. Along the way, they also had to cross through the lands of the Comanche. It may seem strange to comprehend from 21st century standpoints on race, but any non-Comanche traveling through Comanche territory was subject to immediate Comanche attack. It didn't matter that half of Juan Caballo and Coacuchi's party were natives, or that the Black Seminole were fleeing from the Comanche's number one enemy, the U.S. Army. These were foreigners and unwelcome in Comanche lands, no matter what the reason, even if they were just passing through. Given the dangers of the journey, the Seminole Black Seminole Exodus took the better part of a year to complete. In the summer of 1850, it was a race to the Rio Grande, with the Rangers, the U.S. Army, and hostile Comanches in hot pursuit. At the springs of Las Moras, just north of the border with Mexico in Texas, the traveling party crossed paths with a familiar adversary, Major John Sprague, who had known both Juan Caballo and Coacuchi as a young man in Florida many years before and was present at their surrender. Sprague looked the other way and drank with the two rebel leaders that night, reminiscing of their days in Florida together. 
Before the next dawn, though, the Seminole Black Seminole group made their final dash to the border and just in time. Someone from Major Sprague's camp had notified the Texas Rangers and they were headed toward Las Morras to capture the group. They were too late. By the morning of July 12, 1850, Juan Caballo, Coacuchi, and their followers had made it to safety across the Rio Grande. They were finally in Mexico. Across the Rio Grande, the Mexican government welcomed them. Juan Caballo made contact with the state authorities of Coahuila, and the government granted them land in exchange for a promise. The newcomers were to defend the border against Apache and Comanche raiders and any Americans who would want to cross the river to cause trouble. Juan Caballo and Coacuchi were made captains in the Mexican army. It was soon after arriving in Mexico that the Black Seminole group got the name Mascogo. This is believed to have come from the word Muscogee, which was the language of the Seminole and Creek, and also sometimes used to describe the people themselves. For a few years, the Muscogos had lived in a few parts of the Musquis municipality of Coahuila, and settled permanently in the town of El Nacimiento in 1852. Even here, slavers would cross the Rio Grande to try to abduct Muscogos to sell back into slavery in Texas, which caused some families to move further inland and deeper into Mexico. Between the time of their initial settlement and the U.S. Civil War, the Muscogo communities of Coahuila welcomed other runaway slaves coming from Texas. These newcomers eventually blended into Muscogo society. After the Civil War, those Seminoles who had survived smallpox returned to the U.S. and resettled in Texas and Oklahoma, but most of the Muscogos remained in Mexico. While Coacuchi did not survive smallpox, Juan Caballo lived well into his 70s. In 1882, he rode to Mexico City to reaffirm the original Muscogo land grants which were being challenged by mestizo settlers encroaching on Muscogo lands. Juan Caballo never made it to Mexico City, though, and what happened to him along the way remains a mystery. What is the 21st century reality of the Muscogo people? Many of the descendants of the original Muscogos still retain the culture of their ancestors. This is primarily evident in food, dress, and music, the Mascogos of El Nacimiento have forgotten English for the most part, but their lively songs are based in English, mixed with Spanish, and have West African words that no one understands. For special occasions, women will dress in a traditional way, and that includes puffy, colorful dresses with aprons and large kerchiefs on their heads. Foods include sweet potato bread and boiled corn pone with the corn mashed in hollow logs with big poles, the way the indigenous people of the southeastern United States used to prepare cornmeal. Not surprisingly, El Nacimiento is the only town in Mexico to celebrate Juneteenth, and celebrations are low-key and not meant to draw tourists. As many Muscogos leave El Nacimiento and the surrounding areas for other parts of Mexico or to the United States for work, and as many marry outside the ethnic group, there is a sense of urgency to record and preserve Muscogo culture. The Muscogos' formal recognition by the Mexican government as a Puebla Indígena, or indigenous people, is a start, but with increasing pressures from the outside world, it is a race against time. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained. Remember to like and subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter. Tell your friends by sharing these shows with others. Please go to our website, MexicoUnexplained.com, for references, illustrations, and for free access to transcripts of past shows. 
please visit Amazon.com to purchase the books, Mexico Unexplained and Mexican Monsters, to get hard copies of the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. We appreciate your kind attention once again. Until next time, thank you and gracias. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained with host Robert Bitto. For show summary, relevant links and commentary, please check out our website at mexicounexplained.com. Like us on Facebook and be a part of the conversation. Adios and hasta la vista.